This is House Planning Help, episode 67. Hello, I'm Ben Adam-Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in building or renovating. I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century. My personal goal is to create an energy-efficient home before I turn 40 in August 2016. Coming up in this episode, we're back with Graham Hunter from Parity Projects. He's conducted an energy assessment of my family home, and we're going to look at the findings and some of the options. Thank you yet again for downloading the podcast and spending some time with me. It's absolutely brilliant. I love it. And always the feedback is encouraging. So I keep on going and I hope these podcasts are useful for you. Quite often it's tricky for me because I haven't been through the whole process. Really, up until now, all it's been is research. However, I'm trying to take that step and move things forward because I've got my budget. I know more than I did a couple of years ago and we're ready to go. We want to make this happen now. So we've been looking for land over the last couple of weeks, just the preliminary search for it. And I've used a couple of different ideas. First of all, the plot, finding websites and local agents who might have some land. And that has actually been quite disappointing that There is land out there, but my goodness, is it expensive? And often the nice plots, I suppose if you did buy that land, you would have to build a huge house on it just to make it all worthwhile so that when you finally sold, it wouldn't be a waste of that space, which I find a little bit upsetting. And in my local town as well, I just think the options are so much easier to go and buy a bulk standard property developer home because there are all sorts of sites in the town that are being developed, so new properties coming up, although very little area that I could go and do a self-build. It's the harder option, so I'm going to be working harder. However, I do know a local builder who has successfully built his, and I wanted to know how he got his land in the first place. I was having a chat with him the other day and was really interested by his story because he bought an industrial yard. And what I didn't know at the time when he was doing this is that he didn't have any of the relevant permissions and he really was just taking a gamble. And it paid off. So it worked for him, but perhaps he knows more about it being in the trade, whereas hmm, not so sure I would be that brave, particularly if uh, my budget went entirely down the drain then. I've identified a couple of other places very early on in the podcast. We had session six, which was all about finding a plot of land and becoming a detective. That was with Ted Stevens. Really fun episode. Houseplanninghelp.com forward slash six if you want to go and listen to how you can save money. And his idea, just search for it yourself. Knock on some doors, find out who owns the plots that you see and, and whether it's going to work out. So I've identified a couple of brownfield sites that have garages on or whatever it, it might be and thinking my way around that. Actually doing it in practice, it's slightly scary. So there we go. An update on what I'm up to and I'll keep on doing that as the whole project moves through. Hopefully I'll have more of these updates and it might actually be beneficial as well for the podcast that I'll think of new ideas that we could follow through. Our interview today is a follow-up on session 60, so it may not make a lot of sense unless you've listened to that first one, houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 60. And it was a slightly different podcast because I followed Graham Hunter from Parity Projects as he conducted an energy assessment of my dad's house. So now we're going to take a look at the data and go through the various improvements that could be made. I've also had a brief chat with my dad, which we'll hear at the end and find out what he decided to do. First, though, I went into London to Parity Projects HQ and asked Graham to pick up where we left off. What happened to all the data? One of the first things we'll do is we will actually just run the model. So that does all the sums it needs to do and it will um, give us, in this property, for example, we're looking at annual oil consumption and on-peak electricity. We will have figures for those which come out of the software, which we can then check against the data that we got from the fuel bills while we were on site. And so that's where we will tend to do a little bit of calibration if we need to, just making sure that before we start modelling up any improvements to the building, we can be fairly sure that the base case scenario that we're modelling is realistic and so we're not overestimating or overselling any savings from any of the measures. With all that information, it sounds as if it's almost an automatic process. So 
What software are you using to do this, or is it specifically something you've designed to help your needs? It is. Um, so it was designed by two of our company directors. Um, it's based on something called Breedem, um, which is the methodology which uh, then became something called SAP, which is Standard Assessment Procedure, which is what is used to model um, the energy use of new build properties. That is used in another format called Reduced Data SAP, which is what you, um, it's the methodology you'll see being used on an energy performance certificate. So what we've done, rather than trying to simplify it, we've almost consciously tried to make life hard for ourselves and we've actually made it a bit more complicated. But what that then allows us to do is to actually add in little bits and pieces. So for example, we can put in um, the use of the central heating down to the nearest 15 minutes. We can put in data on how different appliances and light fittings are being used, which just gives it that added bit of accuracy and it becomes much more of a a bespoke tool in that way. What have we found then on this particular energy assessment? So it's quite an interesting one, as most of uh, gas properties are. Essentially, that's just because it allows us to look at a lot more options for the heating system. We've looked at things as simple as just replacing the current oil boiler with a new one and then adding in a few extra bits of control mechanisms. But we've also done things like looking at air source heat pumps, for example, ground source. We've looked at different types of biomass systems using um, different fuel types, so going from logs to chip to pellet. And just what we try and do is just throw absolutely everything in there, even things which people might not have been considering to start with, just so that we can be comfortable with the fact that we're giving everyone all the options and all the numbers behind them. I think that's the thing to point out. We we try very hard not to make recommendations in the report. We can offer advice um, and we can give people the detail that they're looking for in terms of how they might want to go ahead with the next steps, for example. But we try and keep away from actually saying this is what you should do. Um, we're of the opinion that that's very much the decision of the homeowner. And so we try not to lead people, but we just try and give them all the facts there to be able to make up their own minds. How then uh, does this property compare to others or should we be looking at the figures now? So if I just run through some of the, um, you see on the first page here, we've got what we describe as the headline figures here. So what this is showing you is from the analysis that we've done, uh, we've come up with, I think it was between about 60 and 70 possible measures which could be applied to the house. And what we then do is based on the priorities of the homeowner, we will sit and rank those in level of importance and look at what the paybacks on them are and what what impact they will have. And we then will design some packages, um, again, based around what is the homeowners trying to achieve. The first one, we've got no-brainers. So that tends to be... um, measures with fairly quick paybacks. You see there the the overall package has a payback of 2.2 years. And one of the main reasons we build the packages is actually to show people adding up the individual savings of all the measures is quite a different thing to actually applying those measures on top of each other. So what the packages show is the cumulative impact of applying this um, box of retrofit measures, if you like. I'll just scroll through here. What we've done is we've so we've looked at no-brainers. We've then increased the payback period a bit. So we're looking at what we call some consideration measures. So normally going up to a payback period of about 15 years there. And then once we get past that, um, we're obviously looking at more substantial measures there. Um, so we've called the next one Green Halo. So it's interesting to note that we've um, put a maximum payback of the measures in that package at 25 years. But what we're actually seeing there is if you did apply all those measures together, the overall payback period of that package would actually only be 5.5 years. Rather than looking at measures in isolation, it's saying, well, what happens if we go ahead and, and we approach retrofit in a more whole house way? Going through the packages there, you'll see we've 
we've actually built one which you called CO2 focused. Now, because um, when we spoke to your dad during the survey, he mentioned there was a, an environmental motivation there. Um, so we've considered that and we've looked at some measures which maybe if we were looking at them from a purely cost perspective, they're not things which would be recommended. But if the motivation is solely to reduce environmental impact, then you know these were, are things you might consider. So the big difference in this one is we've gone, instead of replacing the oil boiler with a new one, which looks like financially the best option, we've gone with a biomass option so that we can switch fuels from oil to, um, I think it's pellets we've looked at in this one. And so again, we can get the saving that the client's looking for there. Biomass, I th- think, is a tough one, though, in terms of knowing that you're sustainably sourcing it, or where would your pellets come from, or is that all built into this assessment? Yeah, it's something um, which divides opinion. We've taken a view on it of we're, we're looking at biomass in terms of making the assumption that that fuel is sustainably sourced. But that's um, a big assumption. It, it is, um, but there are lots of assumptions like that which are probably quite a bit beyond the scope of what we're doing here. Another common um, thing which comes up, for example, is people who go to renewable energy companies to buy their electricity. So again, that's, that's sort of going a bit above and beyond. And um, it's quite a good example of the biomass one, actually. Um, I mean, I can think of one previous client who was of the opinion that we should make the assumption um, that that fuel wasn't being sustainably sourced, in which case we can, within the software itself, just adjust the CO2 content per unit for that fuel source and then show them what impact that has. But we're aware that there people hold opinions on these things um, which are obviously affected by things external to what we're doing here. So it's another aspect of um, you know, trying to make this a bespoke service. And if people have those opinions, then we will try and adapt what we do to, to incorporate that. Perhaps we could have a few examples of some of the measures. So this is unusual, isn't it, going CO2 focus? Should we leave that aside for a moment and go back? Because a lot of people will be thinking about the money side. But could we go in depth on one of the packages that you suggest? I suppose no brainer makes the most sense to begin with. Sure, sure. So just to run through what we've looked at here. So this is a package uh, with an annual fuel bill saving of £260, total cost of £585. So uh, doing a quick bit of maths there, we can see that has a payback of just over two years. So the measures within this package, if we just run through them, first of all, we looked at blocking some of the open chimneys in the house. There are various products on the market, for example, um, that can be used to block up those as draft points. So we've looked at the effect of that. We've looked at installing low flow shower heads in the bathrooms. Uh, We've looked at replacing a lot of the halogen spotlights with LED replacements. And then separately, we've looked at some of the incandescent light bulbs as well and replacing them with LEDs. So we, we split up the lights into the different fittings just so that if there's different levels of availability for those different types of lights. And I mean, that sounds, as you say, a, a no-brainer that all of those things, they're not involving deep retrofit or too much thinking. Is there any downside to any of those measures? Um, not really. I mean, those are all quite straightforward, non-invasive measures, which is what we try and do with the first package to sort of show people without too much effort what could be achieved and you know whether it's worth going for those quick wins, first of all, and then having a bit of a deeper think about what's next. Or, um, you know, in some cases, we'll find, for example, people who are quite motivated by energy issues already may well have addressed all the no-brainers. So in that instance, what we can show them with that package is actually there's not much left to do at that level and so then suggest that they might want to go up to the next one. So you've got other measures that 
go a little bit further, maybe you could describe that then. Is that under some consideration? Yeah. Um, so in this one, actually, most of it is replacement of appliances. And we've obviously got the oil boiler replacement in there as well. As we go on to the Green Halo package, you'll see, for example, we start looking at some more fabric measures there. Um, so we've got two measures within that package, for example, looking at different areas of the loft and, and what can be done to upgrade those. I mean, it's interesting to note, we don't actually get to anything like solid wall or flow insulation here until we start putting payback to one side and looking at either CO2 focused retrofit or just going for the whole house idea and just doing everything that could be done. That's really interesting. So what you're saying is the whole house retrofit is out of it in terms of payback? Depending on the motivations, but if the motivation is purely running cost savings. So what about if we, there's no way we can predict what energy prices will be in 30 years time? So I, there must be some fluctuation in this model if energy prices go up. So that's that's obviously another thing to consider. Trying Obviously trying to predict how energy prices might rise um, in the they future. They could go down. <laughs> uh, that would be nice. <laughs> It's, again, something that um, it would be very brave of us to try and predict. So what we do there is with the report that you get, um, we'll send you essentially an Excel spreadsheet as well with all of the measures we've looked at listed. And the reason we give you that is because that has some functionality where people mainly use it for if they go and get quotes for work, they can put in the actual quotes for the measure and then recalculate the paybacks based on that. But it also has a function in there where you can um, add a, an annual fuel price percentage increase and then it will redo the sums. So, for example, if we make an assumption that fuel prices will increase by 5% per year for the next 20 years, then we might see things like the solid wall insulation, like the flow insulation, then looking much more viable. But these, these figures here are based on um, the current costs as they stand. Okay, that makes sense. Are there any other key points to to take out of this? I know you're not going to give recommendations of what you think personally, but anything else we should note? Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, with this one, we're hinting at, at the, the issue of the walls there. Um, this was quite an unusual property in that it had um, quite early cavity wall insulation installed in it already. So normally where we'd look at a property of this age, it would either be empty cavity walls or all solid walls. So internal, external wall insulation would actually look quite cost effective then. But in this case, that measure has already been tackled. So that's it's something where adding further insulation to that then obviously has much less of an effect if compared to there was nothing there to start with. And in terms of air tightness, there is a mechanical ventilation system in the house. Very unusual. Again, I should think of how this has happened organically, though. So is there a measure that you've, you've looked into for that, for making the house more airtight? Or Yeah, again, um, that's one of the more unusual aspects of this house, with it having the heat recovery system there already. I would assume when that was installed, there were some works carried out to try and improve the air tightness a bit um, probably not not necessarily okay um, I mean what we've seen in the um, if you look at the drafts page for example we have actually noted that the drafts are quite few and far between for a property of this age it's not saying there are none it's just saying comparatively it's actually doing quite well so we've only found a couple of things like, for example, um, sealing up the chimneys and looking at uh, sealing those wooden floorboards. Well, Graham, thank you very much. It's been fantastic to trail you as you've gone around your work and to see it at this end. And uh, I'll give my dad a nudge next. <laughs> Thanks very much. Before I give you all of the links for today's show notes, we started our episode 60 by looking at the house and chatting things through with my dad and why he wanted the energy assessment. So it makes sense to me to go around full circle. I asked him what he made of the whole process. Yes, it was an extremely interesting 
exercise. I thought the house was reasonably efficient, but um, although I was told that I had double glazing throughout, so that was good. I had insulation in the wall, so that was good. I had uh, loft insulation up to the required 10 inches or so, but still I was using over 3,000 uh, litres of oil, which was producing 10 tonnes, approximately 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide. So that was a bit of a shock. And of all the measures that were suggested, what are you going through? Have you got to that stage of deciding? Yes, I have. I shall certainly do the items that have a quick payback. The The first one of that would be to put a chimney sheep in my lounge chimney, which I seldom use. That is apparently going to cost me £40 and will save 36 So that's an obvious return. The other items that I will do will probably be to renew my boiler. There's a payback of four and a half years on that. And also replace the downlighters in the kitchen, in the bathrooms and in the landings. That's got a pretty big payback uh, fairly quickly uh, if I replace the existing downlights with LED units. Was there anything from the report that surprised you as to how long it would take to pay back? Oh, yes. I mean, overall, the cost of implementing all the suggestions to bring the house up to a really good standard was going to cost £53,000 and uh, the payback would be over 30 years. So obviously that's not something I'm going to undertake with all the disruption that would uh, be involved. So I shall only be doing the things that give me a good quick payback, which are not too disruptive. And you mentioned as well when we did our first episode that you would be interested in the CO2 more than the cost. But the cost does play on your mind a bit, doesn't it? Yes, it does. The idea of being um, a good inhabitant of the world and producing very minimal CO2 emissions suddenly becomes rather more difficult when you realise that you've got huge disruption, huge cost uh, and very little payback. I think really the the long and the short of it is all these things need to be built into the house in the first place. And that is the, the lesson I've learned from this, that new houses should be built to the very best standards from the word go. But it does also pose that question of the new houses are one thing and a lot of the time they're not being built to this standard anyway what's going to make the big wins is the retrofitting and it's not attractive really is it <laughs> it's not if you're occupying the house i guess uh, if the house is sold and the the newcomers were very ecologically minded and they thought that they wanted to completely redo the house there wouldn't be the disruption element although, of course, there would be the cost. So I guess it's when houses change hands that these things really should be done. Well, it's been interesting to go on this journey with you. So thank you very much. You're welcome. You can find today's show notes at houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 67. Along with the key points, we also take a look at some of the analysis that we got back from Parity Projects. I've included a couple of pie charts showing things like energy consumption, CO2 emissions. So definitely worth taking a look at the show notes. And we have links to Parity Projects. Again, a big thank you to them. One more bit of business and then we'll finish up. Just wanted to read you this iTunes review. Thank you very much to Theodore Squared from the United States. That's his handle. Ben's podcasts are just the right length and filled with relevant and current information. His interviews are well thought out and he asks the very questions that I'd want to ask. I've downloaded and listened to every one so far and subscribed to. Although I'm listening from the US and building practices are different here, there's more than enough meaningful information and techniques that translate very well to where your house is no matter what the country or climate.
I commend Ben for his hard work and his service to the construction community, educating both home builders and homeowners on practical eco-friendly construction that is being implemented now. Fantastic, Theodore. Thank you so much. It's quite a difficult balance that I try to tread, as you can imagine. I do want this to be helpful wherever you are in the world, but I fully appreciate that because most of the content in the UK, it's probably most relevant here. Anyway, if you're listening and you found this of value, I would love you to write an honest review of the podcast in iTunes. It's great feedback for me. And also it helps anyone who is prospectively looking at the podcast and thinking, should I download this? What's it all going to be about? So that would be much appreciated. That's your lot for today. Catch up next time. Cheers.